All right, if you're a visitor here and haven't heard uh, this kind of preaching before, you may not understand why your pastor said what he did, but it's, it's the truth. Up and down this country, they're calling Bible believers Ruckmanites. How many ever been called that? Let me see your hand. Well, you put it down some jackass calls you that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I mean, no, nobody but a blank fool would think of a thing like that. I mean, unless he's an educated fool. You've got you to go to college to be that stupid. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. How many of you people believe the Bible is the Word of God before you ever met me? Let me see your hands. What do you call them Ruckmanites for? What is this, a cult up here? <laughs> it's <a> Modlishites. <laughs> We're going to have Brother Modlish down to speak at our graduation next uh, May, Lord willing. And uh, you know when I invite a fellow down, I... I'm not one of these fellows, you know, does somebody a favor because to do me a favor. I never have been that kind of a person, never will be. And I'm inviting him down because he can preach. Amen. And folks say, well, why don't you invite him down before? I never heard him preach last year. <laughs> First time. <time. laughs> that's, that's no kid. First time I heard him preach was up there at uh, Auburn, New York, I guess it was. And I figured he got something. I want to invite him down for that. And I want to invite him down because I want to have him see what a live church is like. I mean, you've got a good outfit here. It's good. You're alive. I mean, you're not dead. But, but you need just a little bit more. <laughs> I mean, I don't see anybody running around the building, you know. <laughs> and uh, I hope you hang on at this place. I worry about you. I pray about you. The government going the way it's going to go, it's going to try to shut down every church in America like this one. Now, you mark what I'm telling you. You got you got enough people here that believe in this work and enjoy this kind of work. So when that time comes, you fight here. You fight. Don't you let Brother Motley shoot all by himself. You fight here. Fight. Resist. Resist. I'm a Protestant, brother. I've even protested. Amen. Amen. All right. If you have a Bible tonight, let's turn to uh, Romans chapter 14. I want to draw you a picture on verse 12. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. My subject tonight is hypocrites in the church. And I'm glad you're all here this evening. <laughs> all right, Romans 14, 12. Romans 14, 12. Romans 14, 12 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That's a great verse. And that verse says, If you just remember that accountability is personal, lies between you and the Lord, you will stay out of trouble. You start out of trouble. If you could just keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, you wouldn't have any problems. I mean, the trick is to keep your eyes on Him. I've never been able to do it. My German shepherd is always a rebuke to me. I, I, when I have a dog, I have nothing but German shepherds. I, I raise them and breed them. And you take German shepherds, uh, their attention, the, the attentiveness they give to you, I wish I could give to the Lord. And every time I look out the window and see them, the German shepherds that they're looking at me, it gets me under conviction. I mean, those birds will watch you if you cough. They'll move their head. I wish I could wait on Jesus Christ like that. Now, he says, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. You know, when I first began to preach, uh, my messages were all down south. I preached around Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, most preached in North and South Carolina, up in the Blue Ridge. And when I first began to preach up there, there's an alibi I heard from unsaved people so often that I thought it must be indigenous to the Southland. Then I got preaching up north, and I found out the Yankees talk the same way, too. And it goes like this. Maybe you've heard this conversation before. You say, um, are you saved? Well, now, preacher, no use trying to lie about it, you know. I don't know why they say that. You never asked them a lie to start with. And they say, no use trying to lie about it. I don't live like I should. No, sir, I don't profess to be no Christian. But I'll tell you one thing, I ain't no hypocrite. And when I get saved, I'm going to live it. Now, don't you wish you had a dollar for every time you've heard that, if you've done any personal work. And, you know, the trouble is, they, they say, well, it's the hypocrites in the church. There are too many hypocrites in the church. Hypocrites in the church. Hypocrites in the church. It's strange to me. The only thing they ever worry about is hypocrites in the church. I mean, the hypocrites in other places besides in the church. How come you don't worry about them? They're hypocrites at rock concerts. They're hypocrites in the grocery store. They're hypocrites at uh, the professional ball uh, stadiums. How come you never worry about them? And folks, all those folks, they don't profess anything. Why should they do? They profess to be honest. You never met a man in your life that lives up to everything he professes. 
If you met a man live up everything he professes, he'd be Jesus Christ. I know people, I know people that don't profess to be saved, but they profess to love their wives, and they don't. I know people that don't profess to be saved, but they profess to pay the debts, and they don't. They always worry about hypocrites of the church, hypocrites of the church, hypocrites of the church. I talked with a fellow running a gas station one night, and I must have dealt with him about an hour and got nowhere. We went round and round. And he kept talking about the hypocrites in the church, hypocrites in the church, going in and out and pumping gas. And after about an hour, I got tired of it and got to believe. And I said, well, I'll tell you one place where there's more hypocrites than in a church. He said, where is that? I said, in a gas station. <laughs> and he didn't appreciate that a bit, you know. Some folks don't have any sense of humor. <laughs> A lady came to Cotton Mercer one time, a friend of mine. She got a big dip of tuberose in her mouth. That, that's snuff, you know what that is. And she got a big dip of tuberose in her mouth. She said, preacher, she said, what does that, that verse of Scripture mean in the Bible that says whatever is not of faith is sin? What does that mean? Hmm? <laughs> he looked her right smack in the eyeballs and said, well, what do you think it means? And she said, well, if I don't mean throwing ball games on Sunday, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> You see, they always think the other fellow's the hypocrite. You notice that? I mean, some Christians have beer in the icebox, and they talk about the hypocrites that smoke. Then the one that smoke talk about the hypocrites that believe in mixed bathing. And the one that believe in mixed bathing talk about the hypocrites that play cards. And the one that play cards talk about the hypocrites that have beer in the icebox. You know, it's always the other fellows. You ever notice that? I mean, wouldn't it be refreshing to go in the house one time and have a fellow say, I'm a hypocrite? <laughs> but they never say that. They never say that. It's always somebody else. It's always somebody else. Like I stop this fellow here and I say, pardon me, sir, are you saved? He says, wait a minute, wait a minute, before you go talking to me, he said, you go down and talk to old man so-and-so down the street. He and me, uh, he's a deacon down there in the First Baptist Church, and he and me both drink out of the same bottle. You go down and talk to him. I say, okay, I'll go down and talk to him. So I get down and talk to this fellow. I say, pardon me, sir, are you saved? He says, well, I hope I am. I say, I hope you are too, are you? He says, well, I'm doing the best I can. I said, well, the best thing you can do is trust Jesus Christ. Have you done that? Oh, yes, I've done that. Well, you're a professing Christian, right? Yes. You profess to be saved, right? Yes. You profess to be clad in the long white robe, treading the pilgrim pathway on your way to heaven, right? Right. <laughs> A little bit stout there, you know. <laughs> Gets on the scales and the card comes back and says, one at a time, please. <laughs> you know, they, you keep on fooling that. You know, that beer belongs, enjoy it, you know. And friend, and now it's gusto time and now it's Miller time. You wind up looking like you swallowed an air hose, man. That stuff makes you fat. <laughs> I mean, you know, it will we, affect women the same way, you know. Same way. Lady said she went on a water diet and gained 50 gallons. <laughs> Some people, when they're, they're so fat, when they laugh, it looks like somebody opened and closed in a Venetian blind. <laughs> now, that fellow professes to be saved. And I said, what you got in your hand? Oh, uh, just a little hot toddy, just a little nip. Don't get me wrong, I'm no drunker, you know. I can take it or leave it. Sam Jones said a man that could take it or leave it, take it every time he got a chance. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, I'm no drunk, you know, just a little rum Collins, you know, Tom Collins, you know, sidecar, boxcar, Manhattan, Martini, Bloody Mary, slow gin fizz. Don't get me wrong, I'm no drunk, I can take it or leave it, you know. Just a little bit, you know, on Fourth of July, you know, and, and Christmas and New Year's, you know, and, and Memorial Day and Groundhog Day and Valentine's Day and <laughs> when I get up in the morning. Now you say, is that fellow saved? He says he is. You say, can a fellow be saved and, uh, you know, take a little sip once in a while? <clears throat> I didn't say. Now, don't you go out here and say, now, Brother Modlish had a preacher down there and said, if you took a drink after you got saved, you lost your salvation, because I didn't say that. Don't you go out here and say, that preacher down there said, it was all right to drink after you get saved? I didn't say that. You say, what'd you say? Well, I said, if he say, there is. <laughs> if he say, there is. I mean, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, what? No, you're not your body, the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own, you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Can you glorify God in your body with that stuff? You say, yes. Okay, pour it. Don't you give me a hard time, you rascal. I'm way ahead of you. You'll have a time catching up with me. Any of you. Don't you sit there and get upset. Listen. If it's right, do it. Amen? If it's wrong, quit it. 
Amen? If you can't quit it, kick yourself around the block. Don't you get upset with me. It ain't my problem. It's your problem. <laughs> Folks are weird. They get mad at the preacher. They say, I don't believe any preacher got any business talk. Shut your mouth, stupid. Listen, if it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. If you can't quit it, kick yourself. Don't kick me. You negative, dogmatic, vicious critic. <laughs> amen. Amen, amen, amen. I know how these Yankees are. Go out. Yes, sir, brother. Go out the door. Blah, 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 blah. Shut your mouth, stupid. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. If you can't quit it, kick yourself a country mile. Don't you get on me. Well, that will knock you in the head. <laughs> Amen. 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 Let me tell you something. If I was sitting where you were sitting, you wouldn't talk me out of nothing. If I was sitting where you were sitting and a guy was talking like I'm talking right now, and I thought I was right and he was wrong, you know what I'd do? I'd just go on and do it. You wouldn't talk me out of nothing. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. Don't get mad at the preacher. Just quiet in here. Get mad. <laughs> Pardon me, madam, are you saved? I'm a member of the First Methodist Church. <laughs> Good, are you a saved Methodist or a lost Methodist? <laughs> here, here, young man, don't get fresh with me. <laughs> I said, hey, I'm not getting fresh. I just wonder if you're saved. Well, I'm not a heathen. <laughs> well, okay, okay, all right, okay. You know, getting somebody to say they're saved is like pulling a tooth out of an anesthesia. You notice that? Are you saved? I'm a Presbyterian. Well, what's that got to do with anything? Are you saved? I'm a Episcopalian. <laughs> I'm, are you saved? No, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> well, what's that got to do with anything? The word Catholic isn't in the Bible. Who are you trying to impress? You take, you know, did you know the people in America are, are mentally and spiritually sick? They're just sick as a dog. You know, you know what they are? By the way they talk. Are you saved? I'm a Catholic. What do you want to have me do? Stand on my head? I'll give you a thousand dollars if you can find the word Catholic in any Bible. It's not even a Bible word. How about that? Are you saved? My father was a Presbyterian preacher. Are you saved? I joined the Baptist church when I was 12 years old. People are crazy. I mean, suppose you stopped and said, How old are you? He said, 145 pounds. <laughs> and you said, Are you single or married? And he said, Democrat. <laughs> I'm, yeah, man, yeah. I mean, you ask somebody if they're saved, and they throw some church in your face. Uh, beloved brethren, in the name of God, what has a church got to do with salvation? Yeah. Where'd you find that stuff? Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Yeah. You never read a sign out there saying, Rome saves. Yeah. No, man, Jesus saves. Yeah. Roman slaves. That's that stuff. You never saw a sign saying Buddha saves, Muhammad saves. You know why you never read a sign like that? Because they couldn't save a dead horse, that's why. Now let me tell you something. I'm not afraid of what, to tell you what denomination I belong to. If you ask me what church I belong to, I'd tell you I'm a Bible-believing Baptist. And if I was ashamed to tell you what church I belong to, I'd get out of it. And get me one I wasn't ashamed of. But if you ask me if I'm saved, I'm here to tell you right now, the Baptist church couldn't save a dead horse. And neither could your church, your mother's church, your father's church, or your grandfather's church. Like that woman talking to Brother McGinley, the old Scotch preacher, saying, I just can't leave my church. And Jane McGinley said, Madam, that's a modernistic church, and you've got a modernistic preacher that denies the blood of Jesus Christ, and you ought to get out of there. And she said, yes, but it's my father's pew and my grandfather's pew. And he said, ah, pew. <laughs> I say, what you got in your hands? She says, oh, hearts, spades, <laughs> clubs, <laughs> diamonds, <laughs> deuces wild. <laughs> don't get me wrong, I'm no gambler. You know, no five cards, you know, draw seven cards, stuff. just a little game of canasta, you know, rook, you know, rummy, hearts. Don't get me wrong, I'm no gambler, you know. <laughs> Get mighty quiet in here, preacher. <laughs> Some of you folks lost your sense of humor and we're not even getting started yet. 
you say, you say, can a person do that and be saved? Be so far out of me if you say she's saved. Now don't you go out here and say, that fellow down there said it's alright for Christian to play cards. I didn't say that. And don't you go out here and start preaching down there and say, everybody that played cards is going to hell. I didn't say nothing of the kind. You're the biggest liar in 15 counties. You go out and say I said that because I didn't say it. And you say, what did you say? Well, I said, if she say, there she is. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God, giving thanks to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. Can you do that for the glory of God? He says, okay, do it. Don't you get upset with me? You do it for the glory of God? Okay, deal. <laughs> Amen. Lord, bless this deal. Give me a good hand. I'll do this for the glory. <laughs> Thank you. Blackjack, praise the Lord. <laughs> I mean... I mean, you never got in a card game like that, did you? <laughs> and folks, I just say, you know, can't do this and can't do that. Can't. I, I've, had, I've had three Bible conferences with Lester Roloff. We don't often get in a conference. When we get in a conference, I enjoy it. I like to be with him. Because he and I both think the same way. Now, we're not all alike. We're not at all alike. Uh, Roloff and I come from different backgrounds, different, entirely different backgrounds. He's a country, our own city. He's a... Come a crude background, I came from a polished background, well you never guess it. <laughs> and coming up coming up along to there, but I think like he thinks. And I remember one time we had a Bible conference out at Bob Gray's church a couple of years back, and as I went out the door, some lady in the church took me by the arm and said, It's horrible, it's horrible, it's just awful, it's the worst thing. I said, What's the worst thing? She said, You and Brother Olaf. I said, What do you mean? She said, You've taken everything we got, we haven't got anything left. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She said, well, he took our Coca-Cola and coffee and our aluminum cookware, and you took our magazine, newspapers, and television, and Bible versions, and he took the movies, you know, and we haven't got nothing left. <laughs> well, I said, you still got the Lord and the Bible, don't you? She said, yes. I said, beat's going to hell, don't it? <laughs> amen, amen. And I stopped this young lady, pardon me, are you saved? Oh, my, yes, it's the only way to be. <laughs> Oh, good, 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 you know. <laughs> I said, what happened to your head? You get run over by a lawnmower or something? <laughs> you know, you know, you know, Hollywood says, cut it off, and off it goes. Hollywood says, let it grow, it starts growing. Hollywood says, take them up, up they come. Hollywood says, drop them, down they go. You know what that Bible says? That Bible says, be not uh, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know why some of you young people sitting here tonight are never going to find the will of God? And Bob Jones Sr. used to say something real profound. Bob Jones Sr. said, the man who is a success in this life is the man who finds out what God wants him to do and does it. You won't improve that anywhere. The man who is a success in this life is the man who finds out what God wants him to do and does it. And by that standard, Cary Grant and Gary Cooper and John Wayne and Belushi and John Lennon and Elvis Presley and that bunch are the biggest flops that ever fell on their face. Amen, amen, amen. amen. The man the success, the man that finds out what God wants him to do and does it. Now, you know why some of you young people never find out what God wants you to do? You conform to the world. You haven't got the guts to be different. And the Bible said, be transformed. And if you can't be transformed, you can't find what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. I mean, you know, this kind goes along, whatever Hollywood says, that's it. I say, what you got in your hand? Old uh, TV magazine, a real romance, stage and screen romance, soap opera love stories, boy meets girl, girl gets boy, boy loses girl. He got her heart, she got his heart. Best trade hearts, I lost my heart. It's around here someplace, can't find the thing. What kind of, what kind of business? TV or not TV? That is the question. <laughs> Somebody said to me one time, they said, well, what's the difference between TV and movies? Now, I don't know there is any difference. All they're showing right now is all the stuff they made back in the 30s and 40s. That's all they're showing. Some of you folks are watching westerns that are so old, the cowboys ought to be riding dinosaurs. <laughs> TV or not TV? That is the question. Now listen, don't you go out here and say, Ruckman said, everybody had television set going to hell. I didn't say that. And I didn't say it was all right to fool with that stuff either. The Bible said the light of the body is the eye. If the eye is full of evil, the body is full of darkness. If the eye is single, the body is full of light. Now listen, you can't think about doing something wrong unless you've got images in your head to think with. And you can't get them there to think with unless you've seen them. 
That thing is ten times as dangerous as radio. You say, why? The light about is the eye. It's the eye. You get that stuff in there, you get all messed up. Folks say, do you have a television set at home? No, I don't have one. I got one in 1960. I had it a year and a half. 1960, 61, and a half, a year and a half, it broke. I told the guy to come and get it and take it out. He said, you want another one? I said, no. He said, you want the old one repaired? I said, no. He said, you want to trade it in? I said, no. I don't want the cotton picking thing in my house. You say, why? I don't have time for it. You say, well, if you had one, what would you do? I'd look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, well, I know what to look at. Yeah, but you don't look at that. You look at the rest of it, too. If I had one in my house, I'd waste a lot of time. I said, I'd watch. I'd watch uh, pro football. I'd watch the boxing. And I'd watch the ice hockey. I'd watch that stuff. At ice hockey, something about that just makes the skin crawl on the back of my neck, man. Get watching that thing going up and down there. That's the only thing I've ever game I've ever seen that gets me excited. I mean, pro football, I can watch about a half, and then I go on to sleep on them, you know. But you can watch that hockey. Get that thing going up there, and I find myself, you know, kind of come out of the chair. <laughs> I thought that guy said he went to a fight, and the hockey game broke out. <laughs> I played, I played my second game of hockey last year up there in Lansing with those fellows in Brother Green's church, and they gave me an honorary doctorate in hockeyology. <laughs> I'm a bum player, but I enjoy it, man. I tell you, the first couple of days after I got home that meeting, it was bad. It was bad. I mean, I got home, sat down there in a little comfortable little home down south, and there was my wife over there, my beautiful young wife, my two little girls there sitting there in the living room. Now I'm looking across that living room and it turns kind of blue, you know, and I see this sheet of ice stretching out across there about 50 yards and those blue lights. Here the whole body is going, bam, 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 on that wall. And see those old skates flashing, boy, and hear those old things going, clack, 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 clack. It was bad, man, bad. I phoned those guys up and said, don't play while I'm gone. Don't play while I'm gone. I said, I'll play the judgment of God down on you if you play while I'm gone. I've seen the lightning flash and heard the thunder roll, boy. I mean, I've had them coming over my head with skates on both sides. And folks say, you like that? Yeah, I like that. Folks say, us be crazy. Yeah, I'm crazy. Man, is a kid. I like to see things move up, man. I can't stand it for getting dull. I never could stand watching baseball or basketball. That is the dullest. Pink, 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 tweet, pink, 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 tweet, pink, 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 tweet. Let the guy shoot or stop him one or the other. Stop him. I don't stop the guy. I mean, get him stopped. You never, I'll get back to this in a minute, but you never, but you never, you never score, saw a score of 112 to 110 in hockey, did you? Amen, amen, amen. They ought to do something with baseball and make it interesting, you know. Have it fixed so when the fellow throws his bat, he can throw it at the pitcher, you know, before he takes off the. Th- oh, yeah. And then he's going first to uh, second to third, have the shortstop tackle him, you know, something like that. Get the thing going, man. Get it going, you know. The guy standing out there, you know. I want the catcher and the coach. How's your ma, Ed? Pretty good. You like him turn that last wheel? You know? What a thing, man. What a thing. If I had one of those things, I'd, I'd watch that kind of stuff. One of my old buddies in World War II, he came back and he got watching those combat films. You know, you've been in combat, it doesn't do you any good to get reminded of it. <laughs> but he kept watching those things, he had nightmares, man. He was sleeping one night, he, he dreamt he was going up a hill changing clips in a BAR, and he'd change that clip and fire, you know, recoil right up in a BAR. And he'd put that clip in there and blah, 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 and change clips and blah, 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 and change about the fourth clip he grabbed, he heard this horrible scream. And he woke up and his wife was screaming. He'd taken three curlers out of her hair. <laughs> I stopped this fellow here. I say, pardon me, sir. You saved? Yes, sir. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Praise the Lamb. Bless you, Jesus. I'm saved, sanctified. Had the initial evidence, the baptism, the Holy Ghost, talking with the tongues. I said, good. How would you get saved? Well, I went down to the altar and prayed through. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. I said, good. 
How are you getting that in tongues? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I say, well, when you went down the altar, did you pray, did you trust Christ? Oh yes, sir. I prayed through. You prayed through to God. I prayed through to the devil. Prayed through to God. Of course, of course, of course. I said, okay, just checking, just checking. What you got in your mouth? Oh, I don't smoke any, you know, no grass, no pot. I haven't got a joint. It's just little, you know, Winston Salem, you know, Chesterfield, you know, Paul Mall, you know. <laughs> don't you go out of here and start preaching down there and say, everybody smokes, you're going to hell. I didn't say that. You believe you're just lying in this county. I didn't say that. And I didn't say it was all right to smoke. I say, if you say, there is. You know what that Bible says? That Bible says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. Is it all right for Christians to smoke? Sure, any Christian in this building can smoke. All things are lawful. But they're not expedient. But they don't help out. But they don't edify. But they're a bad example. But they defile the temple of God. You take down there in the Pensacola, we had a, years ago down there, we had a big Southern Baptist church down there. And in Southern Baptist churches down south, nearly all the deacons smoke. I mean, 14 Sunday school in church, they're about to have a nicotine fit, you know. You will have the Southern Baptist church in Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, man, the cigarette bus line over the churchyard. And a vandalist came down there, and you know what he did? He picked up all the cigarette butts and bought them in, communion, in, in, a, in a plate and dumped them out of the communion table. All the cigarette butts. All those little southerners. You know, defiling the sanctuary, man. <laughs> and then he preached and said, look at here, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you dump the stuff in your body, what's wrong with dumping it in the church? People don't think things through very well. You take, you take, uh, it's perfectly law for me to light up. Now, what would you think of me if I did? I mean, suppose after this service tonight, I step out there and say, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to do it, but suppose I did. Now, what would you think? And folks say, well, you're a preacher. Oh, get off that. Well, you get off that stuff. Get off that European stuff, okay? Those instructions I quoted you weren't written for preachers. They were written for Christians. Where'd you get the idea of the preacher's body was the temple of the Holy Ghost and yours wasn't? All that pagan stuff. Why, I every, listen, every preacher in this building has done any personal work and done any hospital work has seen this little scene I'm about to mention. You go to the hospital and here's one of your members lying there, you know, hacking his lungs out and coughing his lungs out about 50 or 60 years old and you stop him and ask him how things are going and he says, well, I'm pretty sure. I don't look exactly what's wrong with me. Though. I'm in here for a little bit of emphysema. In the... Taking a few... You, you, you know what's wrong with him? He's dying, man. He's dying. That's what's wrong with him. That Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost you have of God. You're not your own. With the, you're bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. All that stuff. A fellow said to Dwight L. Moody one time, he said, can you find me one verse in the Bible against smoking? He said, no, but I can get you one for it. He said, what's that? Moody said, let him this filthy be filthy still. <laughs> I mean, I'm you ever start thinking what a filthy thing it is to put tobacco in your mouth? It's so, old, it's a Walt Garrison, you know, advertising this Bull Durham, whatever he chews, you know, I don't know what it is. These, these baseball pitchers stand up there. But, but, do you know when you spit that stuff out, a fly won't land on it? That's right, ma'am. <laughs> you never saw a fly land that stuff in your life. Did you ever see some of the stuff that flies land on? <laughs> And imagine, and imagine you putting that in your mouth. <laughs> you say, as he saved, beats the fire in me. He says he is. I stopped this fellow here. Pardon me, sir, are you saved? Am I saved? <laughs> yes, you saved. Young man, I'll know more about the Bible you know about if you live to be a thousand. I know about the Anna Laguna and the Pseudopigrapha and the Anna Lagama and the current substantiation, the difference between the superlapse and the interlapse. What do you mean, am I saved? <laughs> 
Well, I said, I didn't mean to dent your offender. I just wonder if you're saved. Are you saved? No, I don't say this because the fellow wears his collar on backwards. It is unsaved. You know, he just might have a dirty collar or something. <laughs> I see what you got on your hand there. O-R-S-V, A-S-V, New A-S-V, New R-S-V, New I-V, the New King James. <laughs> Weymouth, Moffat, Goodspeed, Charlie Brown, Peanuts, The Wizard of Is, Hagar. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't you go out here and say, Ruckman, say, everybody reads anything but the King James Bible is going to hell. You lie, you full flush and liar, you lie like a dog. You know why I talk that way? I've had him go out and do that. I've had him go out and say, Ruckman, please, nobody has a right to anything but the King James Bible. You little pipsqueak, you little lying, false mouth, slander you. I see these big old papers coming out, Hiles Anderson College. We use nothing but the King James Bible in our classrooms. Boy, they're more fundamental than we are. We use 24 different versions. And only believe one of them. <laughs> Have you ever noticed these fellows keep saying, We use, we use, we use. Hey boy, do you believe anything? Mighty quiet. We prefer the King James. We use the King... Do you believe it? You never get a word from them. If you went to Bob Jones University and got there on the platform, there'll be a pulpit right there, and right where Bob Jones the Third preaches you to step in there, there'll be a little sign of that pulpit saying, please use only the authorized version from this pulpit. Hey, Caiaphas, what do you got to have the note for? Trying to fool the suckers? Trying to make the chumps think you believe something you don't believe? Listen, you come down to my church, there won't be a little sign under there saying use only the King James. You can use any Bible you want to use. I'm an American. I am not a cultist and I'm not a fascist. And my people don't believe everything I say and they don't do everything I do. I believe in freedom and liberty. you never met a guy in your life who more in liberty than I do. You Believe me, you don't. When I go in a restaurant and says, please wait to be seated, I never wait. <laughs> no, sir. Not me, man. I'm paying the ticket. I sit where I want to sit. And folks say, well, what if they want you to sit there? I'll leave the dump. You're not going to make me sit in some place and give me the shaft, too. You made one or the other, but not both of them. <laughs> amen, 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 amen. I mean, I, listen, I don't care what Bible you use. If you want to use a living Bible or amplified, it's a free country. It's your funeral, not mine, man. Help yourself. I don't care. We had a guy come down to our church one time. He was a missionary, and he didn't know exactly how things stood. And he came and got up there, and he had a new ASB and began to preach out of it. I didn't rush up on the pulpit, you know, wave my fist in his face. You heretic, you apostate. I can behave myself like a gentleman, whether you think I can or not. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. Well, let the guy go on. I mean, he preached about ten minutes, and pretty soon my folks began to go. <laughs> he knew he was in trouble, boy. I never had to tell him nothing, man. Next time he got up, he had the right Bible. <laughs> I don't care what you use. I'll tell you, I, some of the brethren, you know, you know, Ruckman, a cult, a cult, a cult. That bunch of whitewashed hypocrites. Let me tell you, why you? They hurt my feelings. You take the head of Lester roll up with Bob Jones a couple of years back. And amen, brother. <laughs> and they got him up there. They got old Lester roll up up there and they made him the Christian of the year. Why, he and me believe exactly the same thing. How come they never made me Christian of the year? <laughs> oh, boy, I'll tell you. I enjoy my Christianity. <clears throat> you know why that is? Because when Roloff, I'll get back to this in a minute, but when Roloff gets up there and gets talking, the professors, and then after it's over, they get back in the classroom, and the kid raises his hand, so what about Roloff? He says, King James, the professor says, well, he's a good old fella, he's a nice old fella, he just doesn't know, you know, but God bless him, let's just don't talk about him, because God is using him. See? Now, suppose I got up there. <laughs> Boy, if I got up there... Oh, Ackman and Panosian and Wiz and the rest of me sitting over there like this. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. After that thing was over, the kid go back in the classroom and say, what about this? And the fellow would just have a fit. 
He goes apoplectic. I mean, you know why? A man who can teach Hebrew and Greek, which I can teach, is not supposed to believe what I believe. I'm a traitor to the cause of scholarship. I've got as much education as any neurosurgeon you got in this town. Any one of them is going to back me down. And I'll leave that old book from cover to cover just like it's written. Thirty-three years ago, when I was led to Christ by a Baptist preacher, he took up that book and said, You believe that's the Word of God? I said, Yep, that's it. And he led me to Christ. It's thirty-three years later. If you pull that book on me right now and say, You believe that book's the Word of God? I'd say, Yep, that's it. I have moved that far. So I'm a bad boy. I'm a bad boy. Your pastor's got his nerve to invite me in here. <laughs> yeah. All that kind of business. I know what the trouble is. I know what the trouble is. They're scared and they're yelling and they're crooked. Then they have some other problems on top of that. <laughs> you take that thing right there. You got a King James Bible? If you got a King James Bible, it says the love of money is the rule of all evil. If you have a new King James Bible from Jerry Firewell, it doesn't say that. If you don't believe it, check it when you get the copy. You got a King James Bible? You got a King James Bible that says in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, when Christ rose from the dead, the proofs were infallible. If you've got an ASV or new ASV, the proofs aren't infallible. If you've got any Bible but a King James Bible, in Luke 2.33, the virgin birth of Christ attacked. In Luke 24.51 and 52, the ascension is, is attacked. The plan of salvation is attacked in Acts chapter 8.35 and 8.37. If you've got any Bible but a King James Bible, the deity of Christ attacked in Acts chapter 4. If you've got a Bible, the King James Bible, the deed of Christ attack in 1 Timothy 3.16, I don't care to fool with books that attack my Savior. God Almighty has said that He may have the preeminence, the preeminence, the preeminence in all things. I won't fool with a book that doesn't give Him the preeminence in all things. Now, if you want to, help yourself, honey. It's a free country. Help yourself, but don't waste my time. Is He saved? Beats the fire of me, he says He is. If He is, there He is. Uh, pardon me, uh, madam, are you saved? I'm not a he, I'm not a she, I'm a he. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, you could have fooled me. <laughs> I mean, these days you never know what you're looking at, you know, sometimes. Out in California, they marry and they say, do you, whatever you are, take this, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> to be whatever you're trying to be. <laughs> I'm really bad, you know, ten years ago, the men looked like women, and the women looked like men, and now they are. <laughs> I stopped the guy downtown one time, and I said, uh, what do you want to look like a woman for? He said, I'm a man. I said, I didn't say you weren't a man. I said, what do you want to look like a woman for? He said, I'm a man, you better believe it. I said, I didn't say you weren't a man. I said, what do you want to look like a woman for? He said, I'm a black belt in karate. If you don't think I'm a man, just try me for size. I said, you hard of hearing? <laughs> I mean, I asked him, I said, what do you want to look like a woman for? Strange. Why do you want to look like something you're not? Putting on a show? Talk about being honest. Being honest, if you're honest, you'll be yourself. If you're yourself, what do you want to look like something you're not? All that long hair stuff. You say, how long is long? Well, that's easy. The Bible says a woman's hair is given to her for a covering. What does it cover? Well, if you're a woman, your hair covers the back of your neck. Or it covers your ears. Or it covers your forehead. So if you have a hair that covers the back of your neck, or your ears, or your forehead, you got a woman's hair. <whistles> You're welcome, there's more coming. We got the generation. The generation, they down there at home, where I'm down home, they go out the door so mad, just mad. They go out there just about to, you know, strip the gears, burn out a clutch plate, about to blow a gasket. They go sailing out there and say, I'm going to go back here again. All it does preach about my hair. Let me tell you something. If you know us Bible preachers very well, you know before we get through with you, we're going to preach about more than your hair. We'll pray about your nose and your eyes and your wife and your children and your mother and your father and your belly and your diet and your companions and your amusements before we get through. What a generation of people. Can't stand the preacher talking about my pretty little head. <laughs> well, go suck a bottle, honey. You know, you know I've, I've, 
I, I've been saved now for 33 years. I, I go to the spa. I don't go as much as I used to, but I go to the spa a couple of times a week and pump a little iron, you know. Of course, my age, you know, it isn't, it isn't uh, bodybuilding. It's just care and maintenance when you get up my age. <laughs> but you know something? But you know something? I have never got used. Now, I've seen this thing scores of times. I've never got used to see some guy back there press lift, you know, 400 pounds, just muscle like a bull ape man, shoulders coming out of his ears. <laughs> Going back there, the hair dryer, and going. It's weird, man. It's weird. Big old. <clears throat> you know. I mean, some of those folks, they must be queer as a three dollar bill. <laughs> now I stop this fellow here. I say, "Pardon me, sir. Are you saved? Ah, what business is yours?" <laughs> Well, I just wonder if you're saved. If I was a time place that thing like that, get out of here. <laughs> really saved, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm saved. Beat it. <laughs> really got the joy down your heart, don't you, man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know this kind. You know the Bible says? The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. You say, can a fellow like that be saved? Be the fire to me. He says he is. Uh, you have a fellow said Andrew Jackson one time. He said, Jackson, you ought to control your temper. He said, shut up, you fool. I control more temper in five minutes than you do in five months. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. I mean, a man ought to have temper, <laughs> but he shouldn't lose it. The idea is control it. The Bible says, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The Bible says, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Christians are kind of hypocritical about some things, you know. I mean, before they get saved, they call it temper, and after they get saved, they say it's, they're nervous, you know. It all amounts to about the same thing. All about, about the same thing. Now, I stopped this uh, lady over here. See her? She doesn't drink. She doesn't smoke. She doesn't dance. She doesn't dip. She doesn't spit. She doesn't chew. She don't go with them at do. And as she goes to church, she ties. She reads her Bible. But my stars, look at that tongue. <laughs> Sam Jones... Sam Jones says some women have a tongue so long they can, they can sit in the living room and lick a skillet clean in the kitchen. <laughs> now that Bible says a fool's voice is moaned by a multitude of words. That Bible says a hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. One old long-tongued sister like that could do more damage in a church than a half a dozen drunkards and whoremongers. You know that? I've been going down this country now for 33 years in about 900 churches. I've seen all kinds of things. And there are many things I know nothing about. Really, honestly, I'm a very ignorant man along some lines. When it comes to technical books, things like logarithms and mathematics and physics and uh, Federal Reserve System and banking and all that stuff, I'm a very stupid man. I can't fix gasoline appliances, electrical appliances. I don't trust them either. I'm a reactionary. But there's some things I know. I know church people. I've had to live with church people all my life. And you know, I've been saved for 33 years, and there's still some Christians in this country that don't think I'm even saved. They really don't, by the way I talk. And I want to tell you something. I've got my doubts about some of you, too. <laughs> you know what gets me doubts about Christians? They're so thin-skinned. They're peculiar. They get upset and miff so easy. They're peculiar. They'll sit there and watch you and see if your shoes are polished. He got dirty fingernails. He didn't wash his hands before he came to dinner. You know, this is treading on his cuff link, on his, <laughs> on his cuffs. <laughs> Tread your cuff link, you'd have to have <laughs> But you know what people do? They come to church, they come to church, and they come there to criticize and get offended. Some of you came here tonight curious, some of you came interested, some of you came to get a blessing, and probably some of you here tonight just came in just waiting. I'll get him catching us. He'll say something wrong. I'll catch him in a minute. Yeah, uh, well, you, you take it and blow it out your left ear, okay? You, you're not going to beat me. Listen, I know unsaved men that had more guts and more courage and more patience and more fortitude than some of you Christian people. And it's been a trial for me to be with you. Church people. Church people. Boy. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it's something you'll never understand. I've sat around many a night after a meeting with a pastor and his wife or some folks in the church having fellowship. Thought to myself, boy, what a, what a tame 
What a tame run, man. <laughs> I mean, sitting around in a restaurant someplace eating a Whataburger or Denny's or a Pamburger or a bowl of chili, just sitting around with a bunch of Christians talking, you know. What a, what a waste of time, you know, doing nothing. When those times have come, I've looked out the window, you know, and thought about the old life. Thought of where, about where I'd be today if God hadn't saved me. I looked around at those nice Christian people that live good lives most of their lives. And I said, thank you, Lord, for getting me with the right crowd. And they may be hard to live with and hard to understand, but I'm sure glad I'm with them. And I'm sure I'm glad I'm out with the old bunch tonight. Wait for somebody to get a contract on me. Worrying about somebody to find out a mess around with their wife. Waiting for the wrong phone call to come in, the wrong letter to come in. If somebody to find out I stole a couple thousand dollars, I sure am glad it's tame. I'll just leave it that way, okay? It's okay with me. But you take Christian people. You know how they hurt their works? They shoot off their big mouth. You know how this work will be hurt worse than anything? A bunch of Christians going out there. I don't like the... Not cold enough. The air conditioning doesn't work. Too hot. Too cold in the winter. I don't like the lighting. I don't like the color. The platform's too high. I don't like to be yelled at like that. I don't like the specials. That parking lot looks like a minefield. <laughs> you know out there, unsaved people watching you to see if you have the joy of the Lord. They're miserable. They're unhappy. They're going to hell. And they're watching you people to see if you've got something they don't have. And if all they get out of you is a big tongue lash and gripe in morning, noon, and night, you know what they know? They know you ain't got nothing they don't have. You mark what I'm telling you. Some Christians are specialists in other people's businesses. Why, these, these fundamentalists, they get an idea if they don't drink and don't smoke and don't dance and don't go to the movies and wear a three-quarter leg sleeve and don't wear a matador britches or shorts or something, they get an idea they've gotten rid of all their sins. Why, if you pick up that Bible, read that Bible, you'll find the sins of the tongue are mentioned more than twice as many times as any other two sins combined. Why don't you get a concordance? Check it out. Think I'm pulling your leg? Why don't you get a concordance? So I'm going tonight and find out where it says lips, speech, mouth, tongues, words, and check what those things say. That's where all hell comes from. I like that. You know, I know a man that called the death of 22 million people. 22 million people. And he never pulled a trigger till he shot himself. He just did it with his mouth. The tongue is set on fire of hell. Comes out there. Blah, blah, blah. A lady said to me one time over here in Gardenia, Michigan, she said, well, I've got to leave this church, Brother Ruckman. And I said, I don't think you'll find a better one right near here. And she said, well, I've got to leave. I just know something about my pastor. And I said, why don't you go to and talk to him? Well, I just couldn't talk to him. I said, well, I know the guy, and he's a pretty good guy, and he's a soul winner, and pretty straight in the book. You, you could do worse. Maybe you better stick it out. She said, Brother Ruckman, if you just knew about that preacher, what well, I know about that preacher. I said, lady, if I knew anything about you, know God knows about you, I'd puke. <laughs> <laughs> And she didn't appreciate that either, you don't know. Some folks don't have any sense of humor at all, you know, can't take nothing. The Bible says a hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. You know why Paul said we're fools for Christ's sake? Because a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. That's what preachers do. They get up and talk. In a multitude of words, there wanteth not to sin. A fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. Listen. It pleased God by the foolishness, foolishness, Foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Why, you take, you take tonight, I bet some of your neighbors think you, you take tomorrow night, be even better. You take up north here when some folks go to church on Monday night, the neighbors think they're crazy. That's right, man. Think how do you, you go to church? Tuesday night? Oh, Tuesday night. Oh, where, man, where? <laughs> Why, it's foolishness. What could be more foolish? Here are a couple of hundred people gathered here just to watch a fellow stand up here to shoot off his mouth. 
Isn't that stupid? <laughs> I mean, you think about it, downright stupid, isn't it? What could you possibly be getting out of it? One of my boys, you know, my boys are all athletes. One got a basketball scholarship, baseball scholarship, football scholarship, all this and that. Then all these teams and who traded who for who and what the contract was. I don't know one from another, you know. I, I don't know the Packers and the Buzzards and the Pirates and the Black Sox or whatever it is. The, the Mets from the Buzzards. I don't know what that mess is. And one day my boy said to me, well, he said, Daddy, said, what if it was a Bible conference in town with Brother Gray and Brother Roloff and the Super Bowl was here at the same time? Where would you go? I said, the Bible conference. And one of the boys said, oh, yeah, but Dad. And I said, yeah, I mean it. I would. And he said, but what if the Super Bowl was just about five blocks away? I said, I'd go to the Bible conference. And they said, why? I said, you just get something from that you can't get from the Super Bowl. Yeah. You said, what do you get about a fellow stamp there and taking your hide off and... And blast, you know, what do you get out of it? I don't know. I don't know. I just know you get something. I just know you get something there you can't get any other way. Yeah. Paul said, we're fools for Christ's sake. Why? The tongue. Blah, blah, blah. See this lady here? I'm ashamed to draw her face. I'm not even going to draw it. I'm just going to leave it blank. You know why? She says she's saved, but she wouldn't walk around the block to tell a sinner how to get saved. You say, can a person be saved and never witness? I don't know. Beats me. I understand anybody could be saved and not witness sometime, someplace, somewhere. I don't see how you could do it. The Bible says, out of the abundance of a man's heart, his mouth speaks. Is Christ in the heart? Then it ought to come out of the abundance of the, then it ought to come out the mouth. Folks say, well, I just believe in living. I don't believe in talking about it. Well, the Bible doesn't say, let your works so shine that may see your light. The Bible says, let your light so shine in this that may see your works. What is your light? You know what your light is if you're saved? It's Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Can a person be saved and keep the mouth shut about Christ all the time? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not saying you're called to preach. I'm not saying you have to win ten souls of Christ a year. I'm not saying you have to win a soul of Christ every day of your life. Although some of you probably could if you get busy at it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, I'd be mighty suspicious of a Christian that never tells anybody else how to get saved. And you talk about the things you love. Yeah, you do. You guys sit around and shoot the bull for hours about hunting and fishing. You ladies sit around and shoot the bull for hours about your children, your grandchildren, and your clothes, your houses. You never talk about Jesus Christ? You want me to think you're saved? Well, I don't say you are, I don't say you aren't. If you are, there you are. Now, there they are. You see what I've drawn you there? You know what that is? That's the professing church of Jesus Christ on this earth. And when an unsaved man looks at the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, an unsaved man, you know what he sees? He sees that. Isn't that a crew? There they go along the pilgrim pathway, you know, long white robes, they say. Of course, I don't know, maybe, you know. Everybody talking about heaven ain't choir in there, heaven, heaven, you know. But they say the same. They profess to be clad in long white robes, treading the pilgrim pathway on the way to heaven. And they go along the dusty road to this earth. The world says, come in. And the juke joints say, come in. The road houses say, come in. And the fraternities and sororities say, come in. And the comforters and presbyteries and conventions and associations say, come in. And the councils say, come in. And the United Nations says, come in. And the Vatican Council says, come in. And God said, come out, out, out. Come out from among them, be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and ye shall be sons and daughters to me, saith the Lord Almighty. You should have known by now what the word ecclesia means, church. It means a call out, out, out assembly. You know what the Romans had against the early Christians? I mean, if you just want to boil it right down to the nitty gritty, you know what they had against them? They were antisocial. They didn't look at them and say, Behold how they love one another. They looked at them and said, Behold how they hate everybody. That's what got them in trouble. You take Christians, they were antisocial. Came time to come to the Colosseum, they wouldn't go to the Colosseum. Came time to come and join the worship Diana, they wouldn't join the worship Diana. Came time to pick up the latest fad, they wouldn't pick up the latest fad. They were nonconformists, they were separatists. That's what your Baptist forefathers were called in England. They were called separatists. And they were, one, they were a great deal close to the Word of God than the Puritans were. Or they go along the pathway there. And now, don't say I said they're all saved. I didn't say that. I said they say they're saved. 
I'm like Bud Robertson. He used to say, don't say I said something I didn't say. <laughs> Bud Robertson had an impediment in his speech for years. He could hardly talk, just a poor boy. And he used to say, don't say I said something I didn't say. He was a character. You think I'm a character? You ought to hear Uncle Bud. Somebody said to him, Uncle Bud, one time said, were you poor when you were a boy? He said, why, we were the poor. We only had one meal a day. And they said, what would you do for the other two? And he said, well, for morning, for breakfast, we ate prunes. And for dinner, we drank water. And for supper, we let them swell. <laughs> and Bud Robinson preached one time out in Trinity Methodist Church in Los Angeles, where Bob Shuler was. The old Bob Shuler, the Methodist preacher from Virginia. Not this new freak out there. I'm not talking about that one. And the old Bob Shuler preaching out there. And, and, and Bud Robinson got up there to preach. And he said, now you just tell me what to get on. I'll get it on it, Brother Bob. And Bob Shooter said, well, Bud, he said, we got a sad case in this church. we got some we got some Methodist stewards there that are chewing tobacco. So Bud got up and preached for three nights against chewing tobacco. And the fourth night he got up, and everybody was so mad at him about ready to eat him alive. And he got up with the sweetest smile and said, now, fool, I was going to bring you a message tonight on prayer, but instead, I believe the Lord has laid in my heart a special message about tobacco chawing. <laughs> And the board of deacons, Stuart John, they're sitting there glaring at him, you know, about to chew up nails and spit out the rust. And Bud started, and he said, he began this way, he said, Now, don't say I said something I didn't say. I didn't say that everybody that tore the backer was going to hell. I'm what I said. Don't say I said that, and I didn't say it. I didn't say everybody that tore the backer was going to hell. What I said was, I don't see how any Methodist steward could chaw something that he was afraid to swallow. <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> That's the case. <laughs> All right, now here's Christ. Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, was buried, and rose again the third day from the dead according to the Scriptures. Wherefore, he is able to save to the uttermost all them that come unto God by him, seeing ye ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ, a living Savior, he can save to the uttermost. And he points his finger right down that old sinner's throat, and he says, You, you're lost. You're clad in the filthy rags of your own self-righteousness. You must be born again. Come on and get saved. Jesus Christ living. I'm happy to report you in the 20th century with all this biogenetic DNA, RNA, shock to the moon, backside of Venus and all that incredible baloney. But Jesus Christ is just as much alive today as he was back there in the first century. And if you ever had a head on running with him, you know what I'm talking about. He saved me the 14th of March, 1949. And if I've been under a delusion, I've been under a delusion that lasted for 33 years. You can't get that on drugs, boy. And what I got, you didn't have to pay for. Amen. Folks say, it's, well, it's just a delusion folks get in. But if that's delusion, let me highly recommend it to you. Now, you take down there in Pensacola about 15 years ago at a junior high school. We had a teacher ask the boys and girls to take a piece of paper and write down on who they thought was the greatest living person in the world. And a bunch of them wrote down a bunch of names there, you know, Kennedy, you know, and Martin Luther King and Jesse Jackson, all this stuff, and a bunch of communists. All that junk out there. And they got through it as right in that junk. One kid wrote down Jesus Christ. And the teacher said, that's very fine. She said, Jimmy, but I meant somebody who was living. And that boy said, he is. <laughs> I mean, that teacher had something to learn. And he points his finger down this fellow's face and he said, you, come on and get saved. For 2,000 years, the Lord Jesus Christ has been standing at the crossroads of eternity, inviting men to come to him. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will find rest for your souls. And he points his finger down this fellow's throat and he says, You, you, come on and get saved. Now, blessed is the man that knows when God is talking to him. You know what our trouble is? We always think he's talking to somebody else. I count the happiest day in my life, 33 years ago, the 14th of March, when the Holy Spirit put his finger down in an empty old room where I was headed for a drunkard grave at 27 years old, alone in the world without hope, without God, no family and very few clothes left, and put his finger down there in my throat and said, you're going to hell. I never forget that night. Man, I looked around that room to refer the message to somebody, and there wasn't anybody there to whom I could refer the message. It was for me. I was going to hell. And in 24 hours, I found Christ my Savior. Our trouble is God says, you... And we say, her, him, them, that, these, those, this. That's the problem. God says, you. Blessed is the man that goes when God is talking with him. 
You, you're lost. You're going to hell. Come on, get saved. And he says, nothing to it. They aren't any cleaner than I am. Now, this fellow here, I may take a little drink at night to relax my nerves. At least I don't go around and stick my nose in everybody else's business. This here, I may take a little cigarette once in a while. At least I don't drink. This fellow here, I may be worried about my retirement, my pension. At least I'm not worldly like my congregation. See? You know what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 12? There is a generation that is pure in their own eyes, and yet are not washed in their filthiness. The Bible says in Proverbs, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. You know what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10? He says, We dare not make ourselves that number or commend ourselves as those that compare themselves among themselves. Those compare themselves among themselves and measure themselves by themselves are not wise. What's the secret? Every one of us should give account of himself to God. Set that right there. That's the biggest hypocrite in the whole picture. You know why? That fellow knows what to do to get saved. He knows Christ died for him. He knows what he ought to do. And he hadn't done it yet. And he's hiding behind somebody else as an alibi. They don't make him any bigger than that. Now, Christians, the, the trick in Christianity, if you pardon the expression, the trick in Christianity is not to see how much you can get away with before you cross the line. That ain't the trick. The trick is to see what you can give up for His sake. Christ said, if a man wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's the trick. You know what's wrong among a thousand other things in our churches today all over America? The Christians are all seeing how far they can go doing what they want to do without changing. You ought to be looking for how many ways you can change to please Him. God help you. Father, bless the message tonight. May the Holy Spirit of God honor the word that's been preached here tonight. I know this is your book. What you say is so. You said, let God be true and every man a liar. And these things cross our flesh, because we are our flesh. I've turned over a lot of rocks tonight. And I've uh, stirred up some dirt, Father, and turned over some rocks. Probably had worms and bugs in the bottom side of them. Maybe I haven't turned over all the rocks. Maybe I've missed somebody here tonight. But I've tried to cover most th- things that get after us and work us over. And Lord, I pray you might speak to your people here tonight. And I know as long as your people stay right, they'll have continual revival around here, the soul will be saved around here, and the devil himself can't stop the work from going. If your people just mess around, mess around, try to see how much they can enjoy life without crossing the line, they'll never amount to anything. Now, Lord, speak with somebody here tonight, especially your people. And Lord, if for some unsaved person who came this way tonight, I pray they might see their true condition. May they not hide behind us when we're inconsistent, because we are inconsistent. And the times when we, every one of us, Lord, has sinned against you and done something wrong. We wouldn't want to be a stumbling block to anybody on the Savior tonight. May they fix their eyes upon thee and, and, and be ready to give account of themselves to God. I'd like to have us remain in prayer just a few minutes while the organ plays. Heads bowed and eyes closed here tonight while the organ plays a while. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing. Before we stand and sing, if you're a child of God here tonight, the Lord has spoken your heart about something, I want to talk to you just individually for a few seconds. I want to tell you something. I can't live your life for you. I can't go home to your house and solve all the problems you have with your wife, your kids. And neither can Brother Modlish. We can counsel you, we can teach you, we can preach to you. We cannot live your life. When you go out that door, it's going to be you and God and the devil. And if you lay your life in order tonight, give up what you have for my sake, it'll never last. I'll be out of here in a week, Lord willing. If you do it for Brother Modlish's sake, it won't last. The hours and days and weeks, he's not even around. Now listen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. God help you tonight to pray to your Savior and say, Lord Jesus, this thing in my life has been wrong and I want to get it fixed because I love you and I'm sorry I failed you because I didn't love you. 
And I want you to give me grace to quit it. Or else grace to do it. That it might please you. Because I'm your child. You've been good to me. And I want to be good to you. You do that? I didn't die for you. He died for you. I got an influence over you right now because I'm real. You can see me. You heard me. But I'm not in your body. And the Holy Spirit's in your body. You don't have to live with Him. You get out of here and go up and down these highways. It's going to be you and Him. So then, every one of us shall give account of Himself to God. While we're in prayer, I wonder how many Christians here tonight would raise your hand and say, Brother Ruckman, God spoke in my heart very definitely about something tonight. My life is going to have to go. And it's going to be hard for me. And I'm going to need grace. And I'm raising my hand right now as a signal that I want prayer for grace to do what I've got to do. Would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? All right, thank you. Put them down. That's a couple of hundred hands here tonight. Thank God for you. Now, get a hold of it. You and Him. You and Him. Listen, if you have to go home tonight and lock yourself in a closet or in a bedroom and fight the thing out, Till the tongue and groove is wet with your tears, you and Him. You and Him. Father, bless the invitation tonight. I pray especially these raise the hands. I know what a hard road some of them have to hold. And some of them, Lord God, have been at these things for a long time. Some Christians don't even understand what a, what a fierce thing it is to get rid of something, just a little old thing like tobacco. But these fellows have been smoking five, ten years, two packs a day. They've, they've, they've got a fight that uh, Joe Lewis and Cassius Clay and Rocky Marcel never knew nothing about. And they're going to need grace. They're going to need help. Some of these fellows had trouble with the temper all their life. They haven't got it under control yet. And they're going to have a worse struggle with that than anybody ever had getting out of a jail anywhere in this world. Lord, do something for us supernaturally. Lord, don't, don't abandon us and leave us to our own devices. Help us out, Lord. We're so weak, so sinful. Help these that raise the hand. Do something for them, I pray. Lord, if you have to remove somebody or change the circumstance or change jobs or move things around for them, they might accomplish their vows. Do something, Lord, so they can please Thee. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. We're going to need this, brother. 283. Let's turn to 283 in the hymnal. 283, now we're going to have a short invitation tonight. I don't give long invitations. You waited this long for the service, you can wait for the rest of it. We'll sing 283, we'll go for sing three stanzas before we leave here tonight. The Lord has spoken to your heart definitely about some things you've got to get fixed up. Get them fixed up. I don't say you have to come to the order tonight. If you want to come to the order and pray, you feel free to come. If you want some help, raise a hand. If you want to do your own praying, do it by yourself. You don't have to have a priest to go through. Your high priest is Jesus Christ. Anytime you want to do your own praying, you and Him. You and Him. If you want some help, come down here and kneel and just raise, slip up a hand. There'll be another Christian alongside you in a couple of minutes. Pray with you. Where two or three agree, touch anything in the laugh, see? Sometimes a stranger. Just have another Christian. Turn to him and say, look at here. I need help with this thing. And I'm praying to ask God to do this for me. Would you pray that with me? Get two of you. All right, let's sing, Brother Linus. Maybe there's somebody here tonight. You have never seen your condition as a sinner. Your need for trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior. You ought to come tonight. You say, I drew this fellow. The Bible says all our righteous are as filthy rags. You may look real good in your own sight. In God's sight, you're not fit to enter a decent building. 
Stop thinking about that old Pharisee down there had a lot of good works and stuff. He wasn't fit to be with Jesus Christ. Up there on the cross, there was a dying thief, capital punishment for stealing. And in five seconds, the Lord made him fit to live in paradise. That's the business. Now listen, you give account of yourself to God, not account of me, not account of anybody here. You, you may have stood here, some of you have been in Rochester for years, seen Christians do all kinds of things. It won't do you any good to drum those things up in your mind right now. It'll just keep you from doing what's right. You get hauled up there, you'll stand up there and the Lord say, Okay, why'd you wreck my son? Well, because of so-and-so. The Lord said, I told you, you'll give account of yourself. Not your brother, not your sister, not your wife, not your kids, not your grandmother, and not your preacher. I'll give account of one person that doesn't see the Christ. Be me. That's all. You come tonight. Let's sing a stanza. If you receive Christ, step out of your seat and come while we sing. Brother Levis. Somebody come ahead. Anywhere in the building. Whosoever will, let him come. You will come, come the best way you know how. There are people here to be with you. Come on. Come on. Give a count. Give a count. Give a good account. Say, Lord, here I am. Here's me. Come on, get it fixed. Amen. 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 Come ahead. Come ahead. We're going to sing one more stanza. Come ahead. Then we're going to close. One more stanza. Come on, get it fixed. Come tonight, receive Christ your Savior, go out that door, no one come hell or high water. When you give account to God, you'll not be accountable for that sin because that's taken care of. After all, that's the only sin that'll damn you, is that one. I mean, you commit that sin of rejecting Christ, then all the other sins are uncovered. You accept Christ your Savior, they'll all take the sins and cover them. You may have a rough time of it. I'm not a peaches and cream preacher. I'm one of these positive thinking guys like Charlie Cap and that bunch telling you all you got to do is think it and there it is and speak it and there it is. I don't believe in that bunk. Listen, some of you may have a terrible time getting home to glory. But you trust Christ and you'll get there. Maybe a rocky road, maybe a thorny path, maybe where some of you live for years, the reaping you'll have to reap for the next ten years will be a heartbreak to you, brother. But you'll get home. You can't miss with Jesus Christ. And without Him, you're going to miss it. Now, come on. Give account of yourself. Fix, get this one. If you fix nothing in your life, fix that one. Get that one fixed. Or oh, let's sing. Come on. While we sing, step out. Man, woman. Boy, girl. Man, woman. Boy, girl. Personal workers here to be with you. Come on the best way you know how. People here to pray with you. Coming home, coming home. Instruments continue to play for a verse or two. There's some folks here. They're being dealt with from the Word of God. We want to give them every opportunity.
All right, who's here tonight that uh, got saved after you were 70 years old? Anybody like that? Got saved after you were 70? Anybody here got saved after you were 70? How about after you were 60? Anybody got saved after you were 60? Maybe you don't want to admit it. Come on now. Anybody here got saved after you were 60? There's a lady right here. When did you get saved? Today. This morning. In our morning service. I'm glad you got saved. I don't know what uh, kept you from getting saved all these years. Maybe it's the first time you ever heard the gospel. Maybe you've seen a lot of hypocrites in the church. But I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to give this picture to you, all right? You can have it. Every time you look at it, thank God that you didn't allow the hypocrites to keep you from getting saved. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. We had uh, 1,211 in A Sunday school, 408 in base. We had 1,619 in Sunday school this morning. We had uh, 1,127 in our evening service. Um, we had 70 visitors throughout the day in all of our services. We had $14,037.23 tithes. $2,447.80 in missions offerings, and we had $16,485.03 in total offerings. Forty-five people filled out visitation reports, reporting 67 visits. Nine were saved and soul winning this week. Seventeen follow-up lessons were presented. Uh, Seventy-six of our men were at prayer meeting last night. Sixteen were at the Mariner House Bible study. Amen. Is that a J? Janya? Tanya. Tanya Murray. Tanya, you have come tonight to ask the Lord to save you and give you eternal life. Is that right? You didn't ask anyone but Jesus Christ, right? Praise the Lord, Tanya. He's the only one that can save you. He's the only one that will save you. I'm glad you've asked him tonight. Learn what it is to live for him and serve him and honor him. Amen. Amen. Good. Thank the Lord. Got a lot of exciting preachers going to be here this week and going to be preaching to us. And uh, it starts tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, I know that uh, many of you are making plans to be here. If it's at all possible, you do just that. You'll get the blessing. Had a good day, but we just started. And before you know it, the week will be over like those things go. So don't miss a one. All right. Good. But Larry, you help uh, Scott, you and Larry help this lady get this picture, right? Okay, fix it up. All right. Roll it up. Take it home. Do something with it. You can start your fireplace with it, if nothing else. <laughs> All right. Okay. Amen. All right. I told Brother Ruckman just before the message, I said, that's... He talked to me about what he was thinking about preaching. I said, that's my all-time favorite. Hypocrites in the church. That's it. Number one on my hip parade list. I like that one better than anyone. You probably don't understand why, but preachers do. (laughs) Preachers do. They know why. (laughs) All right. Well, let's pray and go home and uh, get rested up, eat pizza, do whatever you want to do. Come back tomorrow morning. Don't eat too much, get indigestion, lay awake all night. Don't do that. All right. Amen. Well, let's pray, shall we? And thank God we're here and thank Him for His blessings. Brother Jim Ferris, praise the Lord you're here, buddy. Pray for us, will you?